Great, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Uh, and I just uh, want to welcome everyone to Teaching Across Screens. I am Stephen Mucher, Education Program Director, UC Berkeley Extension. Uh, Teaching Across Screens examines big questions about the recent and largely involuntary transition from classroom instruction to online interactive video facing platforms like Zoom. This transition takes on additional significance today as social isolation and just a moment. as sorry here social isolation um, is uh, is now matched with renewed awareness of social inequality in particular through institutionalized racism. Our workshops aim to address the challenges this moment presents for educators and offer opportunities for teachers to think deeply and courageously about what our instructional work means in these extraordinary and difficult times. We are pleased you are here. Before Stephen Torres starts, I wanna mention briefly that Teaching Across Screens will resume on August 18th and will run bi-weekly through the fall. I hope you will put two recently scheduled workshops on your calendar. First, journalist John Bowe will lead a workshop titled, Do You Hear Me? Reaching Students Online in an Age of Disconnection on August 18th. Second, activist and education advocate, Zakaya Sankara Jabbar will lead Making Black Lives Matter in and out of the classroom on September 15th. Details and registration for these events are in your Eventbrite invitation. But today we welcome our UC Berkeley colleague, award-winning teacher and industry faculty, Stephen Torres. In lieu of a full introduction, I will ask you to read more about Stephen on your event invitation and simply turn the camera over to him now for How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Zoom. Awesome. Well, thank you, Stephen. And, and first off, uh, I, I know I haven't had you all in one of my classes yet, but typically I would want to give Stephen what we call a ceremonial one clap. What that is, is where I would in the classroom count to three. We still do this online. I would count one, two, three, and everybody in front of their screen would, screen would clap all at the same time to recognize Stephen. So let's do that right now. We're going to give him a ceremonial one clap. Stephen, one, two, three. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I certainly appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen uh, right now. Here we go. Microsoft PowerPoint. There we go. Share. And that hopefully should be sharing uh, with all of you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to try and make it so I could still see you all. This is one thing that I would love Zoom to do is figure out a little way that I could see more people um, instead of these little slides. But I will do my best. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's workshop, Teaching Across Screens. Again, my name is Stephen Torres, uh, industry fellow and faculty here at UC Berkeley. I have been looking forward to running this class since uh, Stephen, or this workshop, since Stephen asked me to do it. Um, I think like many of you, I'm not sure how many of you, uh, Carolyn, if you saw that video that was in the Eventbrite, or Rachel, maybe if you did, uh, where the, the, the teacher wrote the song. How many of you saw that? I'm curious. Did it? Okay, somebody, okay. Who, who was singing the course with her? I was singing the course. Ah! That was me when we made this transition. And so that, that is what we're going to talk about uh, here today. Uh, but I'm going to share some things with you that I've learned, uh, some things that have helped me. And what I'm really hoping is that they will help you too. Um, now, the first thing I do want to tell you is what's worked for me has worked for me. That doesn't necessarily mean it will work for you. And the reason I say that is, the stuff that I'm sharing with you, if you like it, use it. Harry, take it, use it liberally. All right, buddy, take it into the classes, you know, all that you possibly can. If you don't like it, don't sweat it. No worry about it. You, you don't have to use it. Let it go, right? It, you are certainly free to take what you like, discard what you don't. I'm still learning on this journey, just like many of you are learning on this journey as well. Um, a couple things that we're going to cover today, just so that you have an idea. Uh, I have my second screen. So if you see me looking down at the slides, that's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to ignore you all. Uh, 
uh, even though I can't see quite everyone. Bernadette, welcome back. Bernadette, by the way, that's the greatest name because that's my sister's name. Um, so uh, you, you have the favorite name so far from me. Um, but we're going to talk today about that online experience. We're going to talk about uh, the mindset of engagement, or this is actually my mindset of engagement that I'm going to share with you. Uh, I'm going to share with you some resources, some things that I found pretty helpful. Uh, we'll also go over some student expectations and buy-in that you could utilize. Of course, how do we actually execute this, right? I'm sure like, like all of you, you're trying to figure out how do I make these classes, Amy, really uh, stick for my students and make this a, a great experience. Then we'll talk about some refinement uh, and iteration of remote learning. We're going to get to some Q&A and hopefully time permitting, uh, we'll have some time to do a quick breakout room. Uh, as well. So I'm curious, uh, first of all, how many folks on this uh, call have actually taught online prior to COVID? Anybody taught, and, and when I say taught online or teaching remotely, I mean um, the synchronous type of teaching, not the asynchronous where you record and upload it, but has anybody done the, the synchronous uh, teaching before? Kristen, you have. You know, awesome. Uh, anybody else done synchronous uh, remote? Okay, I can't see everybody on my on mine. Okay, Carla, you've done some awesome. Well, I, I have to tell you, this was actually the first time that I've ever done synchronous online. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to share a story with you about this guy right here. And his name is Groucho Gary. Groucho Gary. And let me tell you about Groucho. On March 9th, Groucho Gary got an email from his principal. Uh, we're going to call this Mrs. C at the school where, she, where he works. And Mrs. C sent Groucho Gary this email and said, Gary, due to the um, you know, health crisis that's emerging, we need you to take your class and move it online completely everything and you get one day to figure it out that's what mrs c's email said to groucho gary well let's just say my friends gary was not happy at all as a matter of fact gary was ticked off gary was like mrs c how in the world do you expect me, an in-person -pers classroom teacher, to take all of this content, to do what I've been doing for years, and you give me essentially 24 hours to figure out how to adapt it to Zoom? Which, by the way, I haven't even used. Gary was not happy. Gary was calling Mrs. C some names. Uh, he was just really ticked off because he was thinking about all of the ways that he knows how to teach in the classroom are no longer usable on this Zoom thing. You know, the engagement, he's thinking about the students. You know, students, he knows how hard it is if they have a phone in the classroom, they're not even watching him in class and they're gonna be at home with their sisters, brothers, pets, and parents? Are you kidding me? You know, Gary was not happy. My friends, I have to tell you something. Groucho Gary, that's me. I was Groucho Gary. And as a matter of fact, Groucho Gary is what I refer to as my, my negative mindset when he starts to come out. Uh, for those of you familiar with Carol Dweck's work, Groucho Gary was me. That's what I was thinking on March 9th. When I got that email from Carol Christ, Mrs. C, I was thinking, how in the world am I going to do what I know that I've been doing and has worked? How am I going to actually adapt that for this new remote online world? I had no idea how I was doing it. I had never taught an online class before, whether synchronous or asynchronous. You know, as a matter of fact, I never really had online classes where it was one to many. 
So I didn't know what I, what I was going to do. And it took me probably a, a good hour, two hours of just being really angry, Carrie, and upset and ticked off before I changed my mindset and thought, okay, how do I adapt? How do I actually take this? I had to kind of take off my Groucho Gary mindset and put back on my entrepreneur hat so that I could figure out how I was going to be able to take the experience that I had in the classroom and make that experience work in this virtual world. Because as we all know, it is not the same, right? You've all experienced that. How many of you know it's not the same? Raise your hand if it's not. Yeah, it is not the same. And so we, I had to figure that out. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I did. Some of the things that I've learned on this journey, but as I mentioned, I'm still learning it, right? Everything that I'm going to share with you is a way. It is not the way. And I'm hoping that we can maybe at the end explore some of the things that have worked for everybody else so that we can all be better as remote instructors, because let's face it, I think this is going to be here for a while. For those of you at the Berkeley campus, I know we've been told, you know, have our classes at least for the fall available all remote, possibly into the spring and who knows beyond as well. So before I get into that, I want to share a little philosophy with you. And I'm going to talk to you about my personal philosophy, Riva, of engagement. This is my philosophy of engagement. Now, as I share this, I, I don't want you to get mad at me because this is my philosophy. My friends, I think a lot of teachers out there have a really poor philosophy when it comes to engagement. A bad one. It, as a matter of fact, my philosophy when it comes to student engagement is that student engagement is created not by the students, but by the teachers. It's the teacher that creates the student engagement. My mentor, John, put it best. And I love this quote. He says, people don't always like to be taught, but they always love to learn. Right? People don't always like to be taught, but they always love to learn. And I want you to think about that. I want you to think about, because as instructors, our job is not to teach, right? Our job is how do we help people learn? What can we do to help people learn? What could we do to have them fall in love with forensic accounting? How do we have them fall in love with science and math? Right? I'm curious, how many parents are in here? Anybody here a parent? Have kids? Okay, several. Okay, awesome. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you want your kids to fall in love with uh, baseball or soccer or swimming or any sport. How would you do it? I could tell you exactly what you would do. You would go out and you would buy two to three textbooks. The bigger, the better. 200, 300. If you can find a 500 pager, man, that's, that's the one for sure you'd start with. And you'd make sure your kid every single day would read a chapter in that textbook. And at the end, they'd have some exercises and you do a couple of those. And then for fun, what you do is you'd every week maybe give them a quiz to throw stuff out and make sure they understand the history of baseball, how it would go right? And then just to really make sure they're learning, you'd halfway through give them a big test that's stressful. And then it, and, and, and if you could even better, you could standardize it across everyone, right? That's that. No, no. If you want your kids to learn baseball, you take them to a game. You get a $10 ticket for the bleachers on a Saturday. You get a hot dog and some popcorn. 
some peanuts. Then you get a glove and you throw some catch. Right? That's what we would do. But that's not what we do when it comes to learning math or learning science or, or pretty much any subject. We don't think about the experience that students can have with it. What we do is we think about our curriculum and our learning objectives and all these things. Let me give you another example. I asked how many of you were parents. I'm curious, how many of you as parents ever took your kids here to Disneyland? Show of hands. Who's been? I'm curious. Who's been to Disneyland? Reva, you've been to Disneyland. When's the last time you went to Disneyland? I'm curious. Okay, it's go ahead. It's been uh, maybe about 10 years. About 10 years. Okay. What was the most amazing, you know, thing that you can remember or ride that you had from, from your Disneyland experience? Um. I'm not a big ride person. I think I like to, it's a small world after all. Small world. Okay. I love that one. I could sing that song for days. Awesome. Who else has been, who else has been to Disneyland? Who else was Disney? Okay. Carla, how about yourself? I'm going to unmute you now. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm about four, four or five years ago. My girls are in, um, uh, twins are 28 now. So they're off on their own, but we have, we would go, Often because I have a cousin who lives in the area. Awesome. And, um, you know, I, I love going. On, it's a small world. It's, it's, it's something you have to go on every year, even if you know the song. But I like the pirates. The pirate, pirates of the Caribbean. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Fantastic. You know, and, and people have these amazing memories of Disneyland. But friends, let's really talk about Disneyland. Right. If anybody's gone in the last couple of years, let's really talk about this overall experience, right? The first thing you do is you go online and you buy those tickets. How much are those tickets nowadays? They're not cheap. We're talking a couple hundred bucks, right? For a family of four, you're spending a small fortune. And then you get to go and buy your airline tickets. Now, now maybe we'll get a little bit of a discount when we can finally go again. But those tickets aren't cheap. And then you book your hotel, unless you have, you know, you're like Carla and you have someone that you could stay with. And if you want to stay in a Disney hotel, holy smokes. But at least you have the anticipation, right? And then finally, the day comes where you get to go to Disneyland and you round your family up and going through the airport is so easy with your children. It's like a breeze, right? No, it's, it's a disaster. I've, I've been, you know, I travel a lot and some of you probably seen some of those lines with the people with kids, you know, going to Orlando and one's running this way, another one's running that way. And then you finally get to Orlando or to LA, you check in, it's the morning of you get in your rental car, you go down there, and you get to wait in traffic. Traffic. And that's just to get into the park. You finally park, you go up, and then there's a line to get inside. Right? There's an emotional roller coaster happening before you've ever walked in the park. And then you finally get into the park. Right? You get into the park. And what happens? You finally make it to the Dumbo ride. <sighs> She's not happy. She's not. You know, and then someone has to pee. Someone has is thirsty. Someone has to do this. You get to go to lunch. Lunch, oh yes. You get to pay almost $10 for eight chicken nuggets. Thank the Lord that they have, you know, the dark side red that has the alcohol, you know, the, the adult beverage, right? For mommy and daddy. Of course, it'll set you back almost 30 bucks, a little over 30 bucks for that, you know, relaxation. Why do people do this? 
Why would they go through all of this stuff? Here's why, my friends. Here's why. Because when the little guy gets to see Tinkerbell and that face lights up, it is immeasurable. You are so happy to take that photo that you will pay any amount. It, it is inconsequential to have that. Disney calls these magic moments, or sorry, magical moments. Those are magical moments. And when you can have these magical moments, Rachel, in a classroom, just like at Disney, parents will put up with a whole lot of this so that when that little tyke sees Cinderella, she's so happy. And they'll put up with, oh, we got to go. Because they get that photo with Snow White. It's these magical moments that make it all worthwhile. The, you, then you get to go home and there's more airlines and all that. You'll put, you, you'll put up with all of that stuff because you've had those highs. In fact, if you were to chart it, I went too many slides ahead. If you were to chart this emotional experience for Disneyland, this is what it would look like, right? The emotional high to the emotional low over time. There's the excitement in the beginning of booking the tickets and then you see the price and you go way below the line, right? You'd book the airfare, but then you get that photo with Tinkerbell, that's that first huge spike. You'll put up with all the other stuff for that last photo of the family. Those two magical moments make all of that hard work, all of that expense, all of it worth it. So let's look at this, how it shakes out with education. If we were to look at students in a class and their emotional engagement, it would tend to look something like this. They sign up for the classes, they're high, and then they see all the work they have to do. And then they start doing the work. Oh, they get a good grade. Oh, they get a little higher, but then they see what the midterm is coming. Oh, there's all that stress. They do well on the midterm. They're above the line. But then there's a final coming. Ugh. You see, if we were to put these experiences side by side of Disneyland and education, we could see why so many people don't feel at times their education is worth it. It's not because the content's not good. It's not because they're learning, they're not learning things because they are. It's because they haven't gone through this engagement of experience to make the knowledge really sink in and matter and count. I'll share with you a framework that I've put together. And when I look at education, my philosophy, I look at it this way. And some people may not like this. But I see two things on the uh, vertical axis. I see content and context. My friends, I need to let you know something. The content doesn't matter. You see, content is ubiquitous. Everything that I teach, you teach, anybody teaches, you can find the same content for free on YouTube. You can. Coursera, Udemy. What's important is context. So you can't necessarily always get good context from someone on YouTube. That's why people pay to come to great universities, pay for good teachers. Now, there's two ways that we can help impart that 
knowledge. One is the didactic method. This is the sage on the stage. This is us lecturing to students. This is us kind of preparing things, doing cases, right? That's the didactic. Or we could do the experiential, the project-based things, the things where people actually learn. And as we do that, we start to have things like rote knowledge. But then we get into conceptual knowledge and then functional knowledge. And lastly, the emotional knowledge. And what I propose, my philosophy when I started my class a couple years ago teaching here at Berkeley was how do I take all of these elements and bring them into a class? Because if we use these elements in specific ways, we can make that education meaningful and understanding. It goes from being a passive consumer of education to an active learner. Right? And that's where we want students to get to because that's how we get engagement is this active learning. Not just the passive piece. Now, please don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not saying that these other things aren't bad. What I'm saying is that there are ways that we can use all four of these quadrants in our classes. And we can do it in person. And now our challenge, Catherine, is how do we do that online? right? How do we take these elements that we've been using already, these didactic rote learning lectures, these conceptual cases, these functional projects, and tie them all together emotionally so that we have the student go on this learning journey, almost like Disneyland, so that there are those huge spikes at one point, and they'll be able to put up with all the other things. Well, here's kind of the tools that I see and the tools that I use. And of course, you may have other tools at your disposal that I don't know about. So feel free to put those into this. But the way I see it is we can use things like frameworks and cases. We can use experiential learning and games. We can apply these learnings to projects. We can give feedback and then we can allow reflection, right? If we can do this in person, guess what? We can also do it, Walter, online, right? We can figure out a way. How can we bring these things and weave them together in a canvas or tapestry that is our class, right? That is your class that you're going to be teaching this fall. As I'm preparing for this fall, since I know it's going to be all online, this is what I'm thinking about is how am I going to bring these elements together to give these students a learning journey that's memorable? Now, it may not necessarily be able to have Tinkerbell. I wish it would but I can sure as hell try as hard as I can to make different moments of learning happen with these emotional punches to get that student really engaged. So how do we pull this off online? Well, there's a couple things that I found useful and I want to share these with you. Again, if you like them, great. If you don't, that's okay too. You may have other ones that you can add. And if you do, please feel free to connect with me and reach out because I want to learn as much about this as well. But how do we pull this off online? The first thing is talk to students. You know, after that hour and a half or so of sulking, uh, you know, and being angry at Mrs. C. I got on the phone and I talked to some of my students. I actually had to go into SCET where I teach that day. And there were some students in there. These are actually two of my course coordinators. And I started asking them, hey, looks like we're doing class online. Have you had classes online before? 
And I asked him, what do you like? What, what didn't you like? What do you think you would like if you didn't? What do you think you wouldn't like? How could you actually make it like a classroom? What are some things? You know, it, it amazed me that many of my students, none of their other teachers even asked them. How could we not ask students? Right? We have to get them involved. They're the learner, right? They're the kids coming to Disneyland. We need to figure out that out. So talking to students, and what I found out actually surprised me. Specifically, I, I teach a lot, um, you know, entrepreneurship and uh, engineering type of topics. And some of my engineers were excited. They're like, oh my God, I cannot wait. Like, uh, I had one, his name is Peru. It's like, what are you talking about? He's like, Stephen, I hate in-person classes. I'm like, what? He's like, I, I wish every class was online. I had never heard that from students before, right? And so I had to dig in with him. What do, you, what, what do you like about online? Why is that meaningful to you? And he shared some of those things. He shared that in class, he feels distracted and he actually feels with the computer screen. Now, by the way, he's a computer science geek, right? He actually loves writing code. But now I can start to understand, okay, these students are going to like this. How do I pull from that? Another tool, what's on screen? You know, several years ago, I was working and uh, doing some work in the, the solar realm. And I was out in New York at a nonprofit um, organization doing some things. And uh, an investor who was producing this movie called Time to Choose asked me to come and uh, watch the rough cut of the movie. I'm curious, has anybody ever seen a rough cut of a movie before? The rough cut? Michael, you're shaking your head. Yes. Tell me about the rough cut, Michael. I was on a, I was in a test audience for a movie years ago that they were just, you know, doing the typical audience testing and there were parts with no sound. There were parts that were the same scene would repeat. It was, it was interesting, but not really narrative. Yeah. How was the movie? I don't remember. It wasn't very yeah. good. Friends, if you ever see a rough cut, they're terrible. I mean, the worst piece of doo-doo you could possibly imagine. I remember sitting in there watching this movie and I was with my co-founder and we're, we, the, the, we, we were supposed to help kind of like be associated with the movie and we're going, oh my God. This is terrible. This is the worst thing. Michael, as you said, there were parts with sound. Like, it was all over the place. There was no clarity. There was no relevance. Like, you didn't know what was happening half the time. The reason I bring that up is because several months later, we went and saw the finished version. We couldn't believe it. David, it was amazing. We were sitting there stunned. We were like, that's not the same movie. It's not. But it was. And what you have to understand is what is on screen for our students is important. You see, you have to understand, we may not like the fact but right now we are competing with YouTube. You to your students are competing with every movie that they've ever streamed for free on their computer. That's who you're competing against. You are their Leonardo DiCaprio, right? You are their Jennifer Lawrence. You may not like that comparison, but you are. You are. So you have to be cognizant with what's on screen. So create a studio. One of the things that I did here at my house is I actually have three areas that I set up as studios because I don't want to always be in the same place. I don't want the same background for every class. In my classes, they're three hours long. We take breaks. There's no way I could sit and 
you know, online for three hours. So we have different breaks. When they come back, sometimes I'm in a different spot. If you have a background, use a different background. Right? Thinking about all these things, thinking about this little platform that you're on as your movie studio, and you have to actually be on. And I'm sure you've all found this. It takes way more energy to teach online, doesn't it? A lot more, right? For me to run this workshop, I'm in here like sweating. I'd probably still be doing that in, if we were live. But it takes a lot to be able to bring this energy because we have to produce this so that people get it. You see, that computer screen for them is a stage. Now, again, I know some people aren't going to like that. They're going to say, well, I'm not an entertainer. No, you're not. You're an educator. But we have to use the tools of entertainment at times. Right? Making sure you have good audio. Right? I couldn't believe some of my students were telling me that some of their professors are just using the microphones on their computer. They don't even have an external mic. I couldn't believe that. Right? Lighting. Right? One of my course coordinators like, Stephen, you're the only one that like, you can actually see you. We had a teacher once that it was so dark, we couldn't really make him out. Right? This stuff matters. We may think it's not that important. But the lighting, the screen, the sound, right? When we're dealing with this platform, we are the movie to the student. And so if we don't take it as such, if you're not thinking that you are, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio every time you go on and you, you're, you're missing out. Now, by the way, please don't be fake, right? You know, you don't, don't do, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, don't act, be real. But you have to understand that the stage that we're playing on now is important and that we can't take these little details for granted because students are only seeing us in this 13 inch screen and we have to make sure they can hear us and see us. Otherwise they will check out, right? We have to make sure we have the energy. Another thing is setting the stage. Right? A lot of professors don't understand this. Setting the stage of what you want, right? To me, when I'm in a class, I require my students have their cameras on because it's just like sitting in class, right? Now, I know that there are different, you know, things around that, especially at different age levels, and, and I get that. So I don't want to, to, you know, step on any toes. But for my college courses, I require the camera to be on. I require them to know what's in their background. True story. I'm sitting there, students tell, he has a, a house where he shares with some roommates and he was set up in front of the bathroom door. Um, and sure enough, he's sitting there talking and his roommate, thank God he had a towel covering a specific area because he walked out in full glory with the little towel and we're like, ah! You know, so... Making sure students understand that, hey, you are on camera too. I see you, right? I engage with you. This is why you, you saw me doing that in the beginning, right? When I talked to Kathy about her great backdrop and Nancy, where she's at, right? Because that's how we still get that engagement. I can do that in the classroom. And so I'm using that same routine that I would do in class online. And students start to buy that as well. So setting the stage. The next thing is working on what I would call your superpower. For me, my superpower is my energy. You probably noticed that, right? I have a lot of energy in the classroom. I have a lot of energy when I teach. This is what I bring to the table. I'm not the smartest person out there. You know, I'm not, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not Jeff Bezos, but I do have this energy that I come. And so what I do is I try and utilize that because that's my superpower. All of us have our own unique teaching superpower. Some of you are experts. Some of you are experts in your field. Some of you understand how things weave together. Some of you understand students learning better than anybody else. Whatever that superpower is, you have to play to it. 
right? I was re recently watching a documentary about Bill Nye, the science guy, right? He was, he was an expert. He loved his science and he was able to share that with students. So whatever your superpower is, build upon that in this new medium. You know, utilize Zoom. There's so many things. That energy comes with also having things like this little clicker. So if I want to give, you know, uh, Carla a hand for a great response, I will give her, congratulations, a hand, right? If I want to ding, say, oh my gosh, that was so expensive. Cha-ching, cha-ching, it's money, right? I went and found a little, you know, couple dollar thing to, to, to bring these little emotions in. Right. And Jesse, the same little smile and, and laugh, that's the same thing students have. Right. Because it's out of the ordinary. It's different. I took the time to actually think about how I could make them laugh. And so they start to be sucked into the, to the class. Right. And every one of us can do this. Right. This isn't just me with my energy. You can take your superpower and actually utilize it. So I, the next thing I want to talk about is what I call the thermometer. So how do I know, is this actually working? You know, being that this was the first time I started doing this, I went and I put together a survey of the students who went through my class. And so I'm going to share this thermometer where I was, and I'm going to share these results, the good and the bad, right with you. So you can see how this stuff that I'm talking about actually works. First of all, I wanted to know that before this semester, and this is uh, Berkeley students and both our uh, on-campus experience and our Berkeley global students from extension. So this is a combination. I had 55 students respond. Over 90% had taken a class online or taken three or fewer classes online. 90% had taken fewer than three classes online. Think about that. So they were new to this experience too. For many of them, it was new. There were some that had more, but for the most part, students are going through this too. And we have to understand that. We have to have empathy that what they're going through is very unique as well. All right, so what are some of the things? That, here are some of the things students actually said. The one who, a couple that took more than 10, they really liked the convenience and flexibility. Those were two of the things. What students didn't like about online classes, I'll share that with you. They found that it was impossible to stay focused. This is what they didn't like or would not like, I should say, also about things. They, they, they didn't like online not being able to engage with classmates like in the regular classes. Um, and you can see that engagement piece. The question that I asked here was, if you've taken a class, what didn't you like? If you did not take a class, what would you not like? And so this was, I'm trying to get to what were their fears, right? And you can see what students were actually thinking. And again, these were college students, so it may be a little different if you're in different levels. I also asked, when your Berkeley classes switched to online, what were your expectations, right? What do they expect from an online experience? If you're a traditional college student and you're thrown to online, what are you expecting? And you can see here that the majority, over 70%, thought it was going to be a lot less or a little less engaging. And what I put engagement was, is you need to act, pay attention, and participate in in class during the instruction. That was engagement to me, was they were actually paying attention and participating. Over 70% thought it was gonna be a lot or a little less by switching. How would you rate total um, engagement of your online classes? Now, here was something that was really interesting. So how would they rate their overall to total student engagement of your online Berkeley classes so far. We took this, I think it was about three weeks before the end of class. So we were, so we were midway through this online. And, and here's what we found is that there, there still was, but fewer people who thought it was a lot less and a little less, that it actually was the same. Some actually found it was better. 
Do you see that? Some actually found that, hey, this isn't so bad. What we're doing isn't so bad. And then I wanted to find out, compared to other classes, how my classes were, and you could actually see here how much more or less engaging were 171 or the Berkeley Extension classes compared to normal classes. So were my classes the same, worse, better? This wasn't comparing to other professors, but my specific classes. And we had about 40% that thought it was less. We had one thought it was a lot less. You always have those. But we had 36% that thought it was about the same. And again, we still had some of these folks that thought the classes were getting better, even though we were shifting online. And this is something we don't always see, right? We always hear from the ones who don't like it, but we don't actually see the people that actually, hey, this isn't so bad. What you're doing is, is working. And I'll share with you here, one of the things that one of the students said is they miss being able to talk with classmates. The one who thought, man, this really sucks. This was their biggest complaint. But the other folks, here's what they were finding was that they would say it's the same engagement. And that gets me to this one. I wanted to know, okay, now that I've done all of these weird, crazy things, how does this experience compare to the other professors that you're seeing? right, who've made the same transition at the same time. And because of some of these routines, some of these practices, some of these things, what we've found was that a lot of them found that compared to their other classes, this stuff is working, right? Understanding the stage, doing these things to have engagement, the talking with students, the cameras on, these questioning. Normally I do cold calling and, and uh, some other questions I'm, I'm not doing on here for, for time's sake, but this stuff works, right? Thinking about these learning journeys and how we can actually create emotional responses will work regardless of the class. I'm convinced of that. Of course, if you don't think it'll work, you know, you don't, you don't have to do it, but I think it certainly helps. I'll go to the next one. What, what students said about what they liked Here's some of the things that they actually liked. The, the engagement of discussion, the thumbs up. We, we take advantage of the breakout rooms. Hopefully here, time permitting, we're going to have a, a, a breakout in a second where we can utilize those things. But getting people involved, um, other classes are very one-sided, right? I had a couple students tell me that basically professors just stopped having live time with them. They just recorded their, their message and uploaded it to uh, canvas and that was it right think about what that says to a student if if a teacher gives up on a class like that's not cool to me anyway um and i hope that's not cool to you right i also asked what factors contribute to an engaged class and here's what they said professor breakouts, lots of discussion and activities. I changed up some of the things I did at the end of the semester where I threw out what we typically would do and I made up some uh, projects and, and some uh, games, uh, right? Interactive communication, right, was a big thing. Lots of activities and so forth. So that's the thermometer. What's the thermostat? Well, the thermostat, my friends, how do you change this? It's something I alluded to for earlier. It's you. It's understanding your superpower. Understanding what you bring to the table and how you can take your class, your students, through this emotional journey that you're laying out over your semester, quarter or whatever time frame your class is that is what causes engagement right it's the combination of your superpower with how you take the student through that journey that's what causes engagement so i have a question for all of you and we're going to do a quick quick uh breakout uh 
if we can. We'll probably take about three minutes to do this, so we won't have a time to get in full discussion. But I have a question for you. Here's the question. What is your teaching superpower and how can you use it to make amazing learning experiences for students? What is your superpower and how can you use it to make amazing learning experience for your students? What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop my screen share. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into breakout rooms. And I'd love for you to, in your breakout room, share with your participants what your superpower is and how you can use it to make amazing experiences. We'll give you about three minutes and then we'll come back for any Q&A and a couple last minute announcements. Here we go. Does anybody want to share kind of what your superpower is and how can you, you use it to, to make an amazing class? Jill, how about you? Could you share your superpower with us? I think it's a combination of storytelling and curation of specific examples. I was saying I tend to give people a lot of links so they can go do a deeper dive if they want. I spot on, hold, hold on, spot on. I totally agree. You get a hand from me. Uh, Jill came and spoke in some of my classes and she was amazing at bringing that stuff together and being able to, to link the, the, the message with the actual data behind it. It was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, anybody else want to share? Anybody else want to share? Dora, was that you wanted to share or were you? Okay, Brian S. Let's, let's go, Brian S. Um, mine is that I'm shy with um, adults, but not at all with my students. Awesome. So, um, and also speech and debate. And I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to using somehow speech and debate in with the classroom to make it more engaging and just more interesting. Oh yeah, that's a that's an a, a, a awesome one. Um, you know, one of the things actually I see Buddy on here. Uh, I, I actually do this speech uh, and public speaking workshop in a class, and it it goes over so well. The students love it. Buddy's a, actually an amazing uh, person at teaching that. Um, it has send it, send it on, whoever that is, please. Buddy, uh, buddy, what, what's your superpower? I'll let you talk and maybe you and Brian can connect. Uh, I'd love to, but it's just a firsthand experience on everything. And I have just, as world's worst speaker, and I just focused on it and I'm having a blast with it. It's just so much fun. Superpower is just, I realize everything relates to a personal experience. Everything. Yeah. Everything. That's great. So, buddy, you and Brian may have to connect. Anybody else want to share I know I'm a couple pages in here, so if I, I see, if you're raising your hand and I don't see you, I, I apologize. Um, all right, go ahead, uh, Anne. Go ahead. I feel like I just won the prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm really, really good at getting people to work with each other. Ah. I don't like it when the camera's on me, so I'm I've you know spent like a long time figuring out how to get the kids to work with each other and. Yeah. Um, and that really, the breakout rooms and figuring out ways to get them going, that, that's my superpower. That's a great superpower, right? Because, you know, especially nowadays, I think, in education, where do you teach, Ann? Um, Berkeley. Uh, so, so at the main campus? Yeah, I was on the main campus this year. Okay. So, so I think one of the things that throughout education I see is just a lack of ability to work in cohesive teams. Right. And, and I see this sometimes with freshmen coming in. They're so used to their individual work that they're not, they don't get it. And even with some of, some of our students on campuses, they don't understand. So that ability to be able to get people to work together, because as we all know, outside of the classroom, when you get into the workforce, you are working together all the time. All right. We have time for one more. Any, anyone else want to share their superpower? Anyone else want to share their superpower? All right, is it uh, Aule or uh, Awele? Did I pronounce that right? Awele. Awele. Okay, awesome. That's a really cool name, by the way. Where, where, where is that from? Ghana or Nigeria it means good Ga journey or one who brings good luck. I love it. I love it. So let's let's share. Let's hear your your uh, superpower. So I'm a drama teacher. And I would say my storytelling 
my uh, improvisational play in the moment and um, fearless, uh, not afraid to fail, to take a big risk. That's By doing awesome. so, the kids begin to take them. Man, that's another one that just can play out so well in the classroom, right? And, and that's really what I want you all to take away is that your superpower, if you utilize those strengths and you take students on that journey, use the rote skills, use the conceptual skills, you know, use the functional skills and then utilize that emotion one because that's the one that I think most people forget about. That combination with your superpower is going to make you an amazing teacher, but more importantly, it's going to help your students learn. Well, listen, everyone, we're, we're at our time. I really want to thank you all so much for allowing me to share this information. I'm still learning this as we go. I highly encourage you to please stay tuned to the Berkeley Extension Teaching Across uh, Screen series. There's many, many more of these uh, coming up, and we'd love to have you join us uh, as we partake in this journey together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating, and thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Have a great day.